Science Magazine presents a special issue each year on the scientific breakthrough of the year. In 2010, it's the first quantum machine. This year's breakthrough of the year is the advent of the first primitive quantum machine. Physicists took a tiny jiggling device and put it into motion in ways that can only be described by the weird rules of quantum mechanics. Uh, this is a breakthrough because uh, no one had ever put a human-made object into a quantum state of motion before, and it opens up a number of tantalizing possibilities, including the possibility of testing the bounds of quantum mechanics and our sense of reality. So for instance, quantum mechanics says that in principle, a person could be in two places at the same time, or you should, according to quantum mechanics, be able to walk through walls. For physicists, the weird thing is not that tiny objects uh, obey the weird rules of quantum mechanics, but that larger objects don't. As physicists, we believe that the laws of quantum mechanics provide us with the fundamental description of the physical universe. And even though in the early decades of quantum mechanics, it was widely believed that these laws would really only apply to tiny objects like photons and electrons and atoms. More recently, there's been a dawning realization that the laws of quantum mechanics and quantum behavior should apply to objects regardless of their size. So to show that quantum mechanics applies to a mechanical system, uh, especially one that maybe is big enough that you can actually see it, would, I think, underline the non-intuitive nature of quantum mechanics. And further, could perhaps show that quantum mechanics applies to very, very large systems, ones that approach our everyday existence. And so that was really the, the driver behind trying to do a quantum mechanics experiment on a large mechanical system. The advent of tiny quantum machines like this raises the possibility that someday somebody might actually be able to test these ideas by trying to put an object in two places at the same time. That's still a long way away, but uh, getting this key first step of reaching the ground state really raises that possibility. The basic laws of physics that govern these things uh, would have been considered to be perfectly well known uh, beforehand. There's a real difference between having an, uh, a system that behaves quantum mechanics on the table in front of you and simply theorizing about it with pencil and paper beforehand. Putting a mechanical object into a quantum state of motion isn't easy. To reach a quantum state of motion, you have to take out all but the last one or two quanta of energy. And this means making the energy of the system very low or making it very, very cold. So what we did is we said in order to first achieve the quantum ground state, we had to look at a, a particular vibrational mode of a mechanical system. So you can think of it as a string on a violin. Uh, a string on a violin will vibrate at a certain frequency if you pluck it. And it turns out that the temperature you have to cool that violin string too in order to get it to its quantum ground state is proportional to the frequency that the string vibrates at. So for instance, if you took an actual violin and you take a string that would normally vibrate at middle A, which is 440 hertz, and you wanted to cool that violin string to its quantum ground state, you would have to cool it to an unbelievably low temperature, a temperature that's far below what anybody has ever achieved for any size system. So what we said is we said, well, let's take the equivalent of a violin string, but let's make its frequency roughly a million times higher than a, a standard violin string, meaning that the temperature you have to cool it to is a million times higher and such that it's a temperature that you can actually achieve. So that was the first innovation, was to, to look at a, a vibrational mode that's sufficiently high in frequency, up in the microwave band, uh, that we could cool it to its quantum ground state. I think it would be fair to the Cleland Group's work to say that there's nothing remarkable in taking an object that vibrates 6 billion times a second, sticking it inside of a commercial dilution refrigerator, cooling it to 15 or 20 millikelvin, and knowing that it's in its ground state, or suspecting that it's in its ground state. The remarkable thing that the Cleland Group did that no one had been able to do before was to actually verify that the object was in its ground state. Any physics experiment on any object necessarily will include some kind of measuring equipment. So for instance, if you kick a ball and you say, well, it's behaving completely classically, you have to look at that ball to see what it's doing. In other words, you have to shine light on it and see what the light tells you about what that ball is doing. 
So for example, if I were to try to look at, let's say, a violin string in its quantum ground state, and I did this by shining a light on it and then looking at, at what the light did, I would completely destroy the, uh, the ground state behavior of that violin string. So I can't look at it with light. Instead, I need to use something that I can look at the system with without disturbing that quantum ground state nature. They stuck with the idea of driving the frequency of their oscillator up as high as possible, but they developed a special kind of oscillator that was easier to track. Whereas in the past, other oscillators uh, simply moved and, and researchers tried to detect the motion by uh, measuring a voltage between the vibrating uh, beam and an electrode. This team developed an oscillator that actually expanded and contracted, and because of the material it was made out of, it produced an electric field when it did that, and that electric field was easier to detect. There are a few physicists who have objected that this isn't a purely mechanical system because uh, the researchers were tracking the electric field that was produced by their, their device as it expanded and contracted. That's a valid point. It's not a purely mechanical system. However, uh, as Galileo legendarily once said, and yet it moves, I think there's very little question that the device is actually moving and that the physicists have controlled uh, its motion in a quantum mechanical way. It's a valid point, but I don't think it's an important one. Um, the oscillator that the Cleveland group studied involves the motion, the breathing-like motion of a solid plate of material, uh, inhaling and exhaling, if you like. Um, and each time it in inhales and exhales, energy is stored in the mechanical deformation of that object. Now, in the particular material that the Cleveland group studied, a little bit of energy is also associated with electrical charge that builds up uh, during the course of that motion, but it's only about 1 or 2% uh, of the energy. So uh, one can safely say that this oscillator is 98 or 99% mechanical. The quantum ground state that we were able to cool our mechanical resonator to is, in a sense, the most boring state because it's the one that has essentially no energy in it or no energy that you can measure. However, you have to achieve that if you want to then really know what your system is doing. It's in a sense the fiducial state for your system. Once you're in the ground state, you can then build up other more complicated and perhaps more interesting states from that starting point. The researchers actually went a key step farther and uh, achieved a few more complicated states of quantum motion. For instance, they were able to feed in exactly one quantum of energy into their oscillator and to put it into a subtle state in which it was simultaneously in the ground state and in that first excited state, uh, a kind of uh, energy analog of the two places at once quantum state. And so what we're actually trying to do now is to use our mechanical quantum system to encode quantum information in visible light and thus be able to perform quantum communication between quantum computers. This is important because if you are interested in using the quantum properties of light for quantum information processing or related ideas, then you live in a world in which you have a choice between two very different robust and mature technologies, one associated with microwaves and one associated with visible or near-infrared light. And by and large, these two technologies can't talk to each other. They can't transfer information coherently uh, between their two domains. Um, there's a lot of interest in the idea that quantum mechanical mechanical oscillators might be able to achieve uh, a coherent transfer of information between microwave and optical domains. So that's an example of a kind of application uh, that this kind of result might lead to. So while it should, in principle, be possible for a person to be in two places at the same time, the probability for seeing that is vanishingly small, and you would pretty much never expect to see it. The same applies to walking through a wall. In principle, you should be able to do it, but the probability that any time that you run into a wall, you would actually pass through it is exceedingly small. You'd have to run into a wall far too many times to actually validate uh, that quantum theory is correct. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.